Welcome to another Anarchism Research Group video. In this presentation, given as part of the Anarchist Studies Network online conference panels, Marcus Lundström talks about the historical divide between anarchism and democracy. Don't forget to click subscribe, like and share this video. Hi, I'm Marcus, a researcher at the Uppsala University in Sweden. My contribution to this Anarchist Studies session builds on a small research project of mine, an explorative sketch of how democracy and radical democracy has been construed, revised and resisted throughout the history of anarchist thought. It builds on a recent article published in a special issue on anarchism and democracy by the journal Theory in Action. And this text in turn builds uh, on this book, um, an anarchist critique of radical democracy, uh, which was published two, uh, two years ago. And my starting point here in this book for exploring the complicated relation between democracy and anarchy was an intense social conflict that played out in Sweden eight years ago in a marginalized city district named Husby. It was the so-called Husby riots that prompted my historical sketch of the anarchism-democracy divide. As I would soon demonstrate, the people of Husby have experiences experiences and evaluations that I believe sheds new light on the notion of radical democracy. This is a picture from the riot in the background. So the concept of a democracy is clearly conflictual, used to gain legitimacy uh, or, dis or to discredit uh, adver adversaries. Everyone wants to be democratic. And over the past 20 years, in the wake of the alter globalization movement and its Occupy succession, democracy has become, as it were, radicalized. And as you know, the word radical stems from the Latin word radix, which means to the root. And radical democracy is then a, a, a rule of the people that takes the promises of particip participation and equality very seriously. Um, but a radical democracy would then also mean a condition of dissensus, a state of conflict. And the key thinker here is of course uh, Chantal Mouffe. In her theorization, democracy is understood as an arena that stages conflict between political programs, ideologies or political wills. And as you can see, um, Mouffe labels this conflict agonism, which is in contrast to antagonism, a productive type of social friction, one that pushes society onwards. The notion of agonism, however, also entails a po political imperative, and that is the popular classes need to be organized in order to be successful in the democratic state arena. Move calls this left populism. However, democratic conflict is more than political, it is also social. And the French philosopher uh, Jacques Rancière, in his book the, De the Democratic Threat, theorizes how democracy as a conflict uh, theorizes how the democracy is a conflict between its uh, core a core divide between rulers and ruled, between governors and govern, the governors and the governed. So in contrast to MOVE, Rancière sees in democracy an inevitable antagonism, an endemic conflict between governors and govern. So it was this democratic conflict that intensified during the long week that became known in the media as the Husby riots, which I will present here. Um, the so-called Husby riots uh, played out during four dramatic nights in May uh, uh, 2013. It was initiated by car burning to set uh, to set up um, uh, yeah people uh, set fire to cars to attract the police with the aim to attack them with stones as a retribution for police for a police shooting that had uh, taken place a week earlier uh, of an elderly uh, resident in the neighborhood. So in response to this stone throwing the police produced um, the following night one of the largest intervention, uh, police interventions in Swedish history. It was about 500 armed officers that entered into this uh, uh, it's a very small neighborhood with severe beatings of 
community residents and this was a very violent invasion and was accompanied with overtly racist insults and this violent intrusion uh, affecting the people of who, who's at large not only the people that threw stones it escalated this conflict and in the following days attacks against the police against police cars and police stations it spread all across Sweden um, for the Swedish government however this situation meant as they put it uh, a threat to democracy and from a Ranzerian perspective, the, the government was actually, I think, quite right on this point. The Husby riots really shook the foundations of the democratic state, albeit, albeit temporarily, um, by challenging the division between governors and governed. While the government spoke about defend, defending democracy, the people of Husby instead spoke about the democratic state as limiting their self-determination and political agency. We, don't, we definitely don't decide for ourselves. It has always been like this. Democracy allows us to put a note in a box every fourth year, but in re reality we don't elect anything at all. We don't take decisions, we vote for others to decide on our behalf. This is our beautiful democracy. This quote derives from a collective, uh, collaborate, uh, collaborative research project in which I participated and we interviewed uh, around 30 Husby residents that had experienced the, this conflict firsthand. So this particular uh, interview excerpt comes from a social worker who was actually out on the streets to restore social order during the riots. And like many others, he was beaten and humiliated by the police. And when he was reflecting on this event, the interviewee describes a condition in which people, the people of Husby uh, do not really decide over themselves, but vote for others to decide on their behalf. So the people we interviewed um, in this study, they were all very critical against the, um, towards the car burning and stone throwing. But at the same time, they did not understand the police intervention as an isolated event, but as a part of a historical pattern. When asked about causes for the riots, interviewees mentioned state interventions of, the, uh, of uh, for instance, dismantling the civic hall, the local care center, the swimming hall and the library. They recalled the state's gentrification project that had forced many families, numerous families, out of their homes. So the police intervention was read by these people as part of an ongoing social conflict. And this quote, I think you can read it by yourself. Uh, because the language is uh, um, kind of nasty. And so when the police intervened with full force in Husby, the residents, uh, they experienced yet another crackdown on their community an already existing antagonism, the conflict between governors and governed became intensified during the Husby riots. This interview excerpt here illustrates how the police intervention was perceived as yet another intrusion from the democratic state. The division between police and people in Husby, between state and society, fueled the conflict between, to speak again with Rancière, governors and govern. I think the dividing line spans right across Husby, between people that desire peace, want to stop perpetrators, have their assets uh, respected, move freely in their own neighborhood, and a few violators that believe in the workings of violence. And in a peculiar way, this official statement of Swedish Prime Minister uh, Fredrik Reinfeldt captures quite well, though perfectly uh, on intended, of course, the social conflict at play here. The Prime Minister certainly refers to a dividing line in between members of the Husby community, between the good and bad forces, as he put it. But nevertheless, he depicts a vibrant conflict between governors and governed. Because the people of Husby do indeed struggle for peace, respect, and to move freely in their own neighborhood. This freedom is threatened by those that 
believe in the workings of violence so strongly that it, is, that it has become their profession. So this dividing line between police and people, the state and society, governors and governed, highlights the social antagonism of democracy, which is all too familiar to the people of Husby. And this antagonism is, of course, not only felt in Husby. It is an experience that nurtures an entire political tradition, namely anarchism. So in the history of anarchist ideas, to which we will now turn, I think we could distinguish between two and often competing approaches to democracy. On the one hand, an anarchist critique of democracy, and on the other hand, an anarchist reclamation of democracy. And these divisive line, uh, lines of thought coexist historically, and they both continue into our days, as I will show in this very brief historical sketch of the anarchism-democracy divide. Let us begin with an uh, anarchist critique of democracy. A useful starting point here is to be found in one of the uncountable definitions of anarchism. And this one comes from England's most uh, prominent, one of England's most prominent uh, anarchist organizers in the late 19th century, Charlotte Wilson, who read anarchism as a struggle against the very tendency to dominate. The leading manifestations of this obstructive tendency at this present moment are property or domination over things, the denial of the claim of others to, to their use, and authority, the government of man by man embodied in majority rule. The the uh, that theory of representation, which ad uh, wills admitting the claim of the individual to self-guidance, renders him the sa slave of this uh, simulacrum that now stands for society. So, in Wilson's row against domination, we find three particular themes that I think uh, has infused anarchism critique of democracy, namely authority, representation, and majority rule. Near all of the classical anarchism attack the notions, uh, the notion of authority, the very principle of ga uh, governance, that which hinders the community or the individual from self-determination and autonomy. But many classical, ana classical anarchists also postulated that democracy, sealed by universal suffrage, will inevitably be managed through representation by a small minority of elected governors, which in turn produces unnecessary and undesirable social hierarchies. And even if the majority, the people, would somehow achieve state power, classical anarchist thinkers warned that the mi minority groups and individuality itself would severely be threatened by such a majority rule. And I have found these three elements of the anarchist critique uh, quite noticeable in the of Emma Goldman, and especially in her critique of the first wave feminism, a movement united, uh, that was united in the demand for universal suffrage. So, uh, Goldman here attacked the very cornerstone of democracy, the right to vote. Along with other anarchist feminism, fan an with other anarchist feminists around the globe, Emma Goldman expressed a severe disbelief in the political potential of the ballot box. In her essay Women's Suffrage, Goldman provocatively pro she provoked uh, and declared that the woman can give suffrage um, or the ballot no new quality, nor can she receive anything from it that will enhance her own quality. Her development, her freedom, her independence must come from and through herself. Emma Goldman here advances an analysis uh, developed 50 years earlier by Mikhail Bakunin, namely that governmental power, regardless of who's wielding it, inevitably produces social hierarchies. A government, however progressive, requires, by definition, uh, of people to govern. In a parliamentary democracy, the driving mechanism to entitled governance is that of representation, uh, elective officials speaking for the people. So Bakunin articulated in, in the 1870s what Goldman found significant for the anarchist struggle in her own time, that the problem of domination cannot be cured by inverting social hierarchies. 
As Bakunin spoke out against the working class overtaking the state, Goldman criticized women's desire to partake in governmental affairs. So besides authority and representation, Goldman also targeted the notion of majority rule. In her essay, Minorities vs. Majorities, she wrote that the majority, uh, that compact, immobile, grousing mass will always be the annihilator of individuality, of free initiative, of originality. Hence, Goldman's critique of electoral democracy and of women's suffrage was clearly rooted in egoist anarchism, a line of thought carefully incorporated and advanced in her political theory. And this line of thought, which she develops from, from Nietzsche and Max Stirner, links majority rule to the suppression of individuals and minority groups. Nevertheless, this fierce rejection of democracy by Goldman and other classical anarchists would take another turn uh, after the severe downfall of the, uh, of the anarchist movement in the late 1930s. And so, in the geopolitical context of the Cold War, a most peculiar thing happens to anarchism's understanding of democracy. While classical anarchism was con concentrated on criticizing democracy, post-classical anarchism increasingly set out to reclaim it. The dominant version of democracy was now decorated with, with a uh, variety of pe pejorative adjectives in order to be contrasted against the anarchist call for a more radical democracy. And this anarchist reclaiming of democracy, the urge to promote anarchy as radical and therefore more true democracy, was particularly developed by Murray Bookchin and Noam Chomsky. While, while they de remained critical to the dominant state capitalist version of democracy, they saw a potential to radicalize the participatory aspects of democracy. And in recent years, we have come to see a multitude of uh, collective experiences with radical democracy. And two notable examples from the global south is the indigenous uh, uh, autonomy in Chiapas and this uh, democratic confederalism in Rojava. But in the global north, uh, the search for radical democracy has particularly been developed in the Occupy movement, where people uh, creatively experiment, experiment with various forms of horizontal and participatory decision making. So as we can see in this picture, the notion of democracy is here, is here indicative. It attempts to show how radical democracy could look like. Furthermore, the anarchist movement has recently come to reclaim the critique of democracy. The developments of fascism and extreme right populism seems to have revived the disbeliefs in democracy altogether. One articulate example is a project launched by the anarchist collective Crime Think called From Democracy to Freedom. And this uh, is from that one. Here the majority rule is once again targeted for limited individuality and minority groups from achieving autonomy. The reclaimed critique of democracy has also teased out additional threads of anarchist thought, especially regarding the uh, exposed hierarchy between human and non-human life. Democracy is a political system that includes non-human animals and nature in general, which in turn legitimizes violence and exploitation to the extreme. The anarchist organizing stemming from groups such as Animal Liberation Front builds precisely on this critique of democracy as a structure with catastrophic consequences for human, non-human animals exploited by the capitalist meat and dairy industries. By reactivating and furthering classical anarchism's uh, critique of democracy, contemporary anarchists have actually sought to bypass the democratic distinction between governors and govern. This picture is uh, from, a, uh, from the presidential election in the United States, in which anarchists took the streets to declare themselves ungovernable. So, to summarize, I think we can see two main approaches to democracy in the history of anarchist, anarchist thought. On one hand, we have the anarchist critique of democracy, a defined composition arrayed against authority, representation and the majority rule. On the other hand, we have the anarchist reclamation of democracy, the understanding of anarchy as democracy radicalized. And these devices in line of thought, they coexist historically, but they also continue into our days. And in an attempt to recognize dialogue between them, 
there is also an anarchist approach recognizing democracy as a step toward anarchy. This is especially notable in the Uruguayan anarchist Luci Fabri, who wrote that democracy and anarchy are not mutually contradictory, but the one represent an advance upon the other. In fact, there is no diametrical opposition between the rights of the majority up, uh, upon which democracy is built and the free consent that is the characteristic of the libertarian solutions. The difference is, instead, a difference of degree. So here Fabry distinguishes between democracy and anarchy, but at the same time describes the radicalization of democracy as a tactical step, however tiny, towards a freer and more equal world. And this approach which hopefully could breach the anarchism-democracy divide, is also articulated by Erika Malatesta, who will conclude my short presentation. What matters is not uh, what matters is not whether we accomplish anarchy today, tomorrow, or within ten centuries, but that we walk toward anarchy today, tomorrow, and always. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>